Uh, well, let's uh, let's get started. So this is our uh, March uh, meeting of New Mexicans for Science and Reason. And our uh, speaker today is Al Zelikoff. Uh, and he's uh, spoken to us um, several times, I think five, I counted. Yeah, uh, really? We should have a like a jacket like they do on Saturday Night Live for the, the five timers. Um, okay, looks like I'm trying to let people <laughs> in here, but okay, Dave is joining. So um, last time uh, Al talked to us, it was about a uh, uh, a smallpox uh, case that may have been uh, let loose from a, a Russian lab uh, back by the Aral Sea. Uh, that was fascinating. And, uh, and so uh, today's topic is long COVID, some unexpected and troubling findings as of early 2022. So um, uh, Al, we'll, uh, after you uh, have your main presentation, we'll have a, a little Q&A, throw that around. Sounds good. Great. So uh, without further ado, Al Zelikoff. Thank you, Dave. Good to be back. Um, the topic that Dave asked me to, to address uh, when he contacted me about a month ago was uh, an update on coronavirus. And um, I looked on PubMed just to see uh, what the literature span of uh, coronavirus was. That is the modern coronavirus, the one we're going to be talking about tonight, not the one that's been circulating for endless generations. <clears throat> there are 148,319 articles on SARS-CoV-2 as of this morning. And uh, I don't think I've uh, read even uh, a fraction of 1% of them. So <clears throat> I was struggling to come up with something that uh, might be tractable and also might add something to what you already know. And so I thought I would talk about what is popularly be become to know, uh, be become to be known as long COVID, and I'll describe what that is. Um, and I'll, I'll also tell you why I think it's, uh, why I think it's important. Let me make sure I can advance my slides here. Right, so uh, this is a, a screenshot from the New York Times of almost exactly a year ago. And uh, it's written by two people who state that they are suffering from long COVID. And essentially what they're referring to is signs and, and, or I should say symptoms that uh, extend for many months, even several years after being diagnosed with the SARS-CoV-2 infection that we call COVID. Uh, you may have noticed that in the newspaper recently that Senator Tim Kaine from uh, Virginia, who ran for vice president with Hillary Clinton, um, believes he's suffering from, from long COVID. So this has, <clears throat> this has garnered quite a bit of uh, interest politically and the National Institutes of Health now has about a $1.5 billion line item to try to study what this is. And this is a screenshot from also almost exactly a year ago when the NIH launched its uh, initiative for, for studying long COVID. So what is this? Well, in the popular medium, and in much of the medical uh, literature, long COVID is a combination of signs and symptoms, and therefore it's clinical. So when I use the word clinical, not, not to sound pretentious in any way, clinical just means in practice, signs and symptoms that might be seen in the clinic. That's where the word clinical comes from. Um, it, it gets often abused by physicians, but it simply means from a practical standpoint, what do you see when you see somebody in the office or in the emergency room or in the clinic? So it includes among other things, uh, symptoms that cross all the major organ systems in the, in the body. So in neurologic, uh, there's described this odd phenomenon of brain fog, which uh, means not being able to think clearly, although it's really hard to put a definition on that. Uh, a little bit more precise with regard to respiratory symptoms with shortness of breath and a cough. And then a wide variety of very difficult things uh, to pin down. Fatigue, sleep disturbance, uh, anxiety, depression, both anxiety and depression. And by definition, um, given to us by the NIH primarily, 
These are signs and symptoms that occur more than five or six weeks after the diagnosis of COVID. And the reason that number was five or six weeks was picked is because we generally think of viral infections as resolving in that period of time. Of course, there are always exceptions. There's some chronic viral diseases. But in particular, the coronavirus family, which includes dozens and dozens of species of coronavirus that cause the common cold, for example, are thought to resolve in a period of time and don't lead to chronic symptoms. So long COVID, at least in the popular literature that you'll see um, in, the, in the news, and also even in some of the clinical literature, is these signs and symptoms that occur and last at least five to six weeks after the diagnosis and then go on indefinitely. Uh, the numbers that are usually quoted for the percentage of folks who've been diagnosed with COVID who have long COVID is somewhere in the 10% range. Don't take that as gospel. It's squishy because the, the definition is very difficult to hang your head on. So I got interested in this because of, of two reasons. One, to see if there were any objective indicators of long COVID, that is not what someone is complaining about, not to in any way dismiss that, but rather are there indicators that we can find for long COVID because that might indicate the way we could go about trying to treat it. And for the moment, there are no good treatments for long COVID, even though there are now probably hundreds of thousands of people in the US alone who would qualify for the diagnosis or the characterization of long COVID. Um, I should say parenthetically, because this, this is the second reason I looked into it, is there are any number of charlatans out there who believe they know what long COVID is and will offer you a wide variety of treatment options, um, all of which cost lots of money. So from a political standpoint or from a policy standpoint, I thought this was also interesting. Now I have to tell you that my going in bias on all of this was, oh my goodness, another post-viral something or other that we don't know anything about and that will never chase to ground. And uh, I like to try to disprove my biases when I can. And in this case, I think there is objective evidence that indicates that there is in fact something going on with this particular species of coronavirus that makes it different from all of the other members of the coronavirus family with the possible exception of the coronavirus that caused the Middle East respiratory syndrome or the first SARS, which occurred, what, 15, 20 years ago, I can't even remember. Um, both of those had a very high mortality rate, but they, unlike the uh, COVID, were not at all transmissible, so didn't involve uh, tens of millions of people, as is clearly the case uh, with COVID. So the information I'm gonna share with you is all very recent. Uh, it, it's starting now to pop up in the literature. So these articles literally have been published in the past few weeks and they're in very reputable places. So they, they caught my attention. And I'm gonna talk specifically about the findings, the objective findings that involve the brain, the heart and the lungs. Um, and if I start to go too long, I'm gonna limit it to the brain uh, and the lungs. So I wanna tell you about uh, a serendipitous study that's been going on in the UK since the early 2000s. It's called the UK Biobank Study. And it has given us a very interesting window into the effects of COVID on the brain purely serendipitously by, by happenstance. So let me first describe this study and then we'll get into the papers that specifically uh, address what I believe are the objective uh, pathological findings, no-nonsense stuff that may well underline the, uh, underlie the complaints that, that patients have of chronic symptoms after they've been diagnosed with COVID. So the UK Biobank study had nothing to do with SARS, uh, nothing to do with COVID. It was started by the, NI, uh, the National Health uh, System, the NHS in the UK in the early 2000s, and their objective was to recruit uh, about 100,000 people who would be willing to, to submit to 
a wide variety of imaging studies. Uh, MRI studies of the brain, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. MRIs of the heart, magnetic resonance imaging of the heart, magnetic re resonance imaging of the abdomen, uh, a look at bone metabolism using dual X-ray absorption uh, spectrometry, and carotid Doppler ultrasounds. So these are all, with the exception of a small radiation dose that's involved with the dual X-ray absor absorption to look at bone and even fat um, deposits in the body. These are all non-invasive studies because they're using either ultrasound or magnetic resonance. And so they're, they're thought to be very safe. And of course we've had magnetic resonance around now for close to three decades and no one's ever been able to identify um, uh, any side effects from having uh, subjected oneself to a three Tesla field. So uh, these are thought to be uh, very safe. And the idea here was to try to then follow people along and scan them a second time and try to correlate those findings of abnormalities if they appear in the brain, the heart, or the abdomen, or in the carotid arteries with sociodemographic factors, lifestyle factors, even genotyping. So this is a massive study uh, that has just been yeoman's work. And as it turns out, it has now given us some very interesting insights into COVID because people who have enrolled in the study and were imaged sometime in the past and then got imaged again, some of those folks also had COVID. And so we have an opportunity specifically to look at uh, changes, if any, in the brain from people who have COVID compared to those people who don't, all of whom who have been imaged twice over roughly speaking the five to eight year period of time. So I have to, to, to bore you with a little bit of medical student level neuroanatomy because we're gonna, I'm gonna refer to these areas of the brain. So um, the, the, the color picture here is the medical student 101 denotation of the uh, areas of the brain that are identified grossly just by what they look like um, on the brain. And uh, I don't have a pointer here, but um, there, are, there are separations in between these areas of the brain that make it very convenient to you, talk you, about these specific areas. You should be able to use your mouse, uh, Al, just kind of wave your mouse. Yeah, I'm uh, trying that. I don't see anything. Do you? Uh, I don't. I don't know why. Okay. Oh, well. I'll go on. Um, okay. I, don't think I, I don't think I need it, um, so I'll, I'll just try going on. Um, so uh, the, the area of the brain that we're gonna be referring to mostly is the, the temporal part of the brain, which means it's on the side. So the view you're seeing here is as if you were looking at the left side of my head from the left side. Uh, my brain would be substantially shriveled up compared to this one, however, given my age. So we're gonna be talking about mostly the temporal uh, part of the brain, but these areas of the brain are grossly, and I mean very grossly, identified with certain functionality. Now, th these are very primitive, descriptive uh, uh, assessments of uh, the way uh, the brain is organized. But the key point here that's not shown in these medical student level pictures is that th th these, these are richly connected with each other. So there are networks of neurons that uh, connect uh, tens of, to hundreds of millions of neurons uh, with each other. And in specifically, we're gonna be looking um, at, the at the temporal part of the brain. And uh, I'm gonna skip this. The temporal part of the brain, the temporal part of the brain is involved in part with language processing, with memory, and also with olfaction. That is to say, sense of smell um, and taste. And most of you are probably aware of the common complaint of people with acute COVID, not long, not necessarily long COVID, but acutely early on in the course of COVID, uh, complaining of loss of taste or uh, smell sensation. And I'll be returning to this point um, in a minute. It turns out to be non-trivial. Um, so the, the temporal part of the brain can be thought of at least in part as where uh, memory and language amalgamation takes place. So where there's a coalescence that is substantiated by connectivity networks that are too complicated for me to uh, 
uh, display here, um, such that if there's damage to the temporal area of the brain, not only do you lose olfaction, but you may lose memory, or you may lose recent memory specifically, or the ability to process new information. And I'll return to this point in just a second. Okay, so what do I mean by brain MRI scanning? Don't have enough time to tell you how the M how MRI scanning works. I suspect a lot of you know, but my point here is that in the, in the British uh, uh, biobank study, what, what they are doing is very extensive MRI scanning and they're using techniques with the MRI that give you information about the volume of the brain that indicate whether or not there is acute, I'll call it inflammation or water accretion uh, in the brain, as well as evidence of whether, whether or not there are small blood vessel changes that include small areas of micro bleeding. So my point in showing you this slide um, is not to overwhelm you with information, but rather to indicate that there are many, many parameters of brain, not just uh, structure, but function that are being measured by, by the MRI. And so uh, many of the people who are originally scanned have had repeat scanning, and it's that group of folks who have had repeat scanning, some of whom also happen to have COVID in the interim between the time they originally got scanned and had their second scan that serves as the basis uh, for this uh, uh, study that I'm about to show you. And um, in the UK alone, uh, it turns out that this biobank study has attracted enormous attention. And there's several, there's almost 2000 different research projects going on. And I'm just gonna be telling you about the one that involves COVID. So this study just got published a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's in uh, Nature Medicine, if I remember correctly. I'm sorry, it's in Neurology. By the way, if you want any of these papers, I'm happy to provide you with the full text, but I've indicated the, uh, the citation there also. And um, the objective here was to see whether or not having had diagnosed SARS is associated with any specific changes in the brain. And they established a priori, not post hoc, a priori, certain networking connections in the brain that are associated with memory as well as um, uh, taste and, and smell sensation. Um, they identified these a priori uh, rather than to do data dumpster diving to look backwards uh, to see if there were changes that might explain some of the brain fog that people with uh, long COVID uh, complain of. So of the 50,000 people who've been scanned or so, it turned out that there were uh, 790 or so folks between the ages of 51 and 81 who had been imaged twice. And uh, the reason that they picked 785 was there were 401 who had uh, SARS in between their, the period of time they had uh, imaged. And they then uh, age and sex matched about 400 controls with them. So a total of 785 people in this study. Um, I'll cut to the chase and tell you what the findings are, and then I'll show you some of the functional stuff that took place. So overall, what they found was in the uh, temporal area of the brain and also in the frontal lobe of the brain, right above the area where the olfactory nerves come up through the nerve into the brain, there's uh, reduced gray matter mass. And gray matter is the number, effectively the number of neurons. They also found that there uh, was tissue damage that was ongoing in the area of the, of the brain that's associated with olfaction with smell. And worrisomely, there was a global reduction overall in brain size. And there was a big cognitive deficit in folks who had SARS versus those who did it. And remember, these are age and sex match folks. And for virtually any other parameter you can think of, whether or not they voted for the Labor Party or the, the Conservative Party, they were identical. So the only variable that is different in these two groups for all intents and purposes is that one group had SARS in between their brain scans and, and the other did not. So here, here are some of the uh, findings and there are dozens of these findings in the, uh, in the uh, article. Uh, for those of you who are interested, the statistics 
the statistical approach is very sophisticated. So they've adjusted for uh, false discovery. Um, and so you can't write this off as just p-values that are small because you've done so many tests, you're randomly going to find in, uh, find, find significant changes that aren't in fact significant. So they adjusted for false discovery rate and all the usual things that would take place in a well-done study. Okay, so what are we seeing here? In the upper left-hand corner, what we're seeing is that if you, if you look at the uh, portion of the temporal lobe that is on the inside portion of the temporal lobe, which is partially associated with memory, partially associated with uh, associations of uh, smell with memory, that's called the parahippocampal gyrus, which is just an anatomical portion, that uh, the percent change as a, uh, over time, so roughly there was about, I think it was two years in between the scans, that if you look at uh, controls who did not have SARS, that uh, older folks tend to have a greater percent change over time than younger folks did, but it wasn't much of a percent change, whereas the folks who had SARS had a dramatically increased change in the volume of that particular collection of neurons in the parahippocampal gyrus. Ditto for in the upper right-hand corner of the orbital frontal cortex, which is most strongly associated with olfaction. No big surprise there because that's in fact one of the main complaints that people have with acute SARS is that they lose their uh, sense of smell or sense of taste. And ditto for virtually every other specific pre-identified networked area of the brain that they looked at. So there's no data dumpster diving here. They also did a cognitive test on folks uh, as part of the routine intake uh, for the study and then repeated after folks uh, had their scan. And here was the test that was involved. It's called the trail making test. So if you look on the left-hand side, there are 25 numbers there. And the trail making test is you take a pen, you put it on the paper, and you're to go from one to two to three to four to five to six, and they time you. And in uh, the trail making test part B, it's the same thing, except you do 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D. Um, try it, it's a little intimidating, especially if someone's looking over your shoulder. And so this, this the neuropsychologists tell us is strongly correlated with a wide variety of cognitive functions, memory, judgment, decision-making, things like that, okay? And so what, they, what was found was once again, the, the change in the time to complete both of these tests, trail A and trail B, was dramatically worse uh, across all age groups in folks who had SARS. That's a, that's a pretty significant neuropsychiatric finding. And it's correlated very well with the anatomical findings that are seen on the MRI. And here's just a memory of uh, a measure of total brain volume. So this is going beyond the pre-specified specific areas of the brain in the study, just looking globally at the volume of the uh, gray matter uh, in the cerebral cortex. So above the brainstem, and it's uh, quite a bit different in cases that is folks who had SARS than in the controls. And it seems to be much worse in the older age groups. And, and you can tell from the 95% confidence intervals that these don't overlap at all. So there's uh, profound statistical significance here. Now, it turns out that an independent study was done, uh, it was just published uh, from China, uh, looking at cognitive changes after COVID in adults over the age of 60. So if you remember the previous slide, in that group that we would expect would show the most market change based on the trail test that was done in the UK and also uh, on the MRI. And so this was a very large study done in Wuhan, by the way, which is where the where SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, almost certainly originated. And so what we, we ended up uh, with um, of the 3,000 people they started to look at was uh, about 1,400 survivors. And their, their match, which I thought was very clever, was uninfected spouses. So could be male, could be female on, on a, uh, uninfected spouse. But that is a clever way of controlling for sociodemographic factors that we know are independently associated with cognitive performance as people age. And so um, what they did was to look at severity of uh, COVID-2 
as a predictor of whether or not there were cognitive changes. And they just defined severe coronavirus as uh, having a high respiratory rate or needing to be uh, intubated um, uh, and put in the intensive care unit. So they were adjusting for severity uh, of illnesses as well. And here were the findings. So the score that they used in the upper left-hand corner is called the TIC score. It's a telephone inventory score. So these uh, folks were all interviewed over the phone. It's been uh, well-established in the neuropsychiatric literature. And what you find is that if, if you look at controls, which would be the spouses of folks who were, uh, spouses of folks who were infected, but the spouse, spouses themselves were uninfected, not infected, was that as the severity of the illness in the spouse who was infected goes up, the tick score drops and it drops pretty darn dramatically. Um, and if you look in the lower left-hand corner, they further differentiated uh, the, uh, the neurologic impact based on whether or not uh, people had completely normal cognition, if they had what's called mild cognitive impairment, MCI. That's the kind of thing that I know I experience, uh, forgetting why I came into a room, forgetting Dave Thomas's name, even though he has said it a half a dozen times to me tonight, versus dementia, which is a true uh, inability to either process new information or um, engage in higher cognitive functions such as judgment. The bottom line here is that among those with severe SARS, the incidence of dementia was substantially greater than in those with non-severe SARS or the controls, as was mild cognitive impairment. So if you look in the lower right-hand corner in kind of a simple summary, what you see is that the tick score drops not only overall, but it progressively drops from the interview that's done at six months versus the one that's done at 12 months. So in summary, what we're seeing here is a progressive cognitive decline in people over the age of 60 who had SARS, especially if it was severe SARS. So folks who had mild SARS didn't have much of a change, but people who had severe SARS did. And while these studies were published contemporaneously and were unaware of it, uh, each group was unaware of the other's work because they hadn't been published yet. You can see that there is a consistency that's starting to emerge in the literature about cognitive changes that occur in SARS. Um, one of the interesting things that the Wuhan folks did was to look to see if there were any other predictive risk factors for whether or not somebody who had severe SARS would go on to develop uh, uh, cognitive change and uh, this graph is attempting to show you, and I wish I could point at it, but if you, if you look at the p-values there, or if you look at the 95% confidence intervals, folks with coronary heart disease, folks who previously had had a stroke, or folks with um, hypertension um, were more likely to experience cognitive decline if they developed SARS. And that's pretty consistent with the general gestalt we have in, in medical practice that folks with diabetes, hypertension, previous coronary disease uh, just do worse overall in terms of their overall survival. That's also true for their cognitive behavior. So based on these two studies, here are some preliminary observations. So we know that there are anatomical changes that not only involve lowering of brain volume in specific areas, that is loss of neurons, that's what that means, um, but um, also uh, an ongoing process of uh, probably inflammatory, who the heck knows, um, in, in folks who have had, had SARS. The uh, loss of smell and the loss of taste, hypo, uh, hyposmia or hypgousia is almost certainly explained by these findings. Um, and you can see these changes even in uh, some folks who are asymptomatic in the British study, although the, uh, the study in Wuhan only showed cognitive changes in folks who had severe SARS. But in the, in, the Wuhan, in the UK study, folks who were merely asymptomatic, just COVID positive, um, had the same changes in brain volume as, uh, as folks who, had, uh, who were hospitalized with SARS. In other words, there was no difference if you remove the folks who were hospitalized with SARS in terms of the findings in the UK study. 
Um, the one other interesting thing that was done was to look to see if in contemporaneous pneumonia cases that were not COVID, if they saw the same COVID related changes in the brain um, in the UK study and folks with garden variety pneumonias, no. Folks with COVID pneumonia, yes. So there's something peculiar about the way the coronavirus is uh, leading to systemic illness in this case in the brain. And we're about to see it now in the heart as well. So th this is a study from uh, uh, the group that I uh, uh, knew when I was at St. Louis University, just published. Uh, it's a beautifully done study. My hat's off to the folks in the biostatistics department there. So what did they do? They looked at VA data. They had roughly speaking 6 million folks in the VA database. So it's mostly male, it's mostly older. And of those folks who had, uh, of those folks in the database, there were about 160,000 who also happened to have COVID between March, 2020 and January, 2021. And that's the uh, middle blue group that you see here. And then what they did was to compare uh, folks who didn't have COVID versus those who did for a wide variety of heart diseases. And I'll show you what those heart diseases are. And they also stratified it by severity of the COVID. Somebody was hospitalized versus not, or even admitted to the ICU if they were hospitalized to see if there were changes that uh, in, the, in the cardiovascular system that were somehow reflective of the severity of the original SARS. All of these folks were at least 30 days past their original diagnosis. So into that period of time that is usually referred to as long COVID, and most of them were way past 30 days. This was up to a year um, after the original diagnosis. Okay, so what are we looking at here? On the left-hand side of the, of the uh, screen are cardiovascular things that go bad. Stroke, transient ischemic attack, a wide variety of arrhythmias in the heart, including the one that those of us in our age group need to worry about, atrial fibrillation, um, inflammation of either the heart muscle called pericarditis, or I'm sorry, my, uh, myocarditis, or of the lining around the heart called pericarditis, and then uh, coronary disease. So typical uh, atherosclerotic coronary disease that leads to myocardial infarction or heart attacks. Uh, other cardiac disorders that may or may not be related to ischemic heart disease, such as heart failure, which basically means the heart not pumping very well due to heaven knows what, and then blood clots, thrombotic disorders. And on the right-hand side are the number of people per 100,000 who had COVID who had one or more of these conditions. So for example, in the, in the very top right of the uh, screen, about five people per thousand, five people per thousand, so that's uh, 0.5 per hundred or about a half a percent, had a stroke within one year. And in the middle is the hazard ratio, which is the time average odds ratio, that's the way I like to think of it, compared to controls. So some controls are gonna get strokes too. And what you see in the top box in the middle is that strokes were about two times greater in folks who had SARS um, than folks who didn't have SARS in the VA database. And you can just go right down the line and you can see that every single cardiovascular condition that we characterize in the big fat book of cardiovascular medicine is increased and in some cases dramatically in people who had SARS versus those who didn't. And you can look on the right-hand side of the screen to look at what the total burden is. So it's one thing to calculate an odds ratio. That's not very informative unless you know, well, what numbers are we actually talking about? So we'll summarize that in a minute, but you can see that for example, in heart failure, about 10 out of a thousand or one out of a hundred or 1% of folks who had SARS went on to develop congestive heart failure. That's an enormous number of people as, as we'll see. So here's, here's summarizing it by groups. And you can see that for any cardiovascular outcome, in other words, any of the six things that are listed above, about 
50 out of 1,000 or 5 out of 100, or 5% of folks develop chronic cardiovascular complications as a result of having SARS. All right. Now, this is a, a bit of a busy slide, but I thought it was important to point it out to you to show that virtually nothing predicts whether or not somebody's going to develop any of these things. So let's look at the middle column here, ischemic heart disease, what you probably know as heart attacks or coronary artery disease. So age doesn't, age doesn't predict whether or not you're likely to get it if you have SARS. Uh, your race doesn't predict it. You are more likely if you're male as opposed to female, no big surprise there. Obesity doesn't really predict it. Smoking doesn't predict it. Hypertension doesn't predict it. So anybody, unlike the acute setting where we know folks who have hypertension, diabetes, previous cardiovascular disease of any kind are more likely to get sick. This is saying that anybody uh, at, at a year, independent of whether or not you have some pre-morbid condition is likely to, to end up, is, is equally likely to end up with one of the complications as opposed to people who don't have any of these underlying typical comorbidities that you've heard a thousand times um, on the news. Now, the other thing that they did that was very cool is that they, they stratified this data because they had 165,000 cases they could do this. Um, into hospitalized, that's in the green, non-hospitalized and ICU. So the sicker you were, the more likely you were to develop any cardiovascular outcome or any specific cardiovascular outcome. No big surprise there. All right. So I just did some simple extrapolations. What does this mean for the United States for cardiovascular disease? Well, there've been 80, 80 million reported infections, doubtless an undercount. Um, there've been about four and a half million hospitalizations to date according to the CDC. And about a fifth of those are in the ICU or about 900,000 ICU admissions. And if you look at the New York Times uh, daily graphs of COVID, you'll see that these numbers uh, make a lot of sense. Okay, so let's look at then all infectees who were not hospitalized. So roughly, if you look in the upper left-hand corner here, roughly speaking, two or 3% of folks uh, will develop some significant cardiovascular outcome. These are not things to play around with. Um, and that means that there are about a million and a half cases of some cardiovascular outcome among folks who were uh, minimally uh, infected or asymptomatically infected, meaning no symptoms, of some chronic cardiovascular disease as a result of the infection. Among those who were hospitalized but were not in the ICU, which was about 3.6 million people, about 15% of them go on to develop chronic cardiovascular complications. That's another half million. And among those hospitalized in the ICU, about 30% of that 1 million people, or about another quarter of a million to 300,000, so the, to date, the, the total cardiovascular burden of COVID, and this is doubtless an underestimate because there are a lot of people who uh, were not tested at all, um, probably 2.3 million additional cases of significant cardiovascular disease in the United States. And if you think about the adult population of the United States, roughly 200 million folks, 1% of the adult population is likely then to go on to develop chronic cardiovascular disease. Yikes. I'm gonna finish with an autopsy study that just came out. Now, this is a small study um, that was done in Switzerland, uh, looking at two things, the distribution of the virus throughout the body. Fortunately, these people died so they could chop them up and look everywhere. Um, and also uh, uh, a brief look at persistence of the virus in various organs. So uh, I tried to summarize it quickly. These are the places that were looked at. Obviously the airways, the trachea and the airways going down into the lung were of interest and the vast majority of people there had uh, virus if they died from complications of, of SARS. Uh, ditto for the lung tissue that is beyond the airways out into the lung tissue itself. But then it's everywhere else. Now, not everybody had it but a third of folks had virus in their heart, half had it in their liver, heaven knows what it does there. Um, and uh, it was seen uh, uh, in about a third of people uh, in their brains. 
Uh, the lamina cribosa is a uh, thin bone right at the top of the nose where the olfactory nerves go into the brain. And unsurprisingly, three quarters of people who were autopsied had virus in, in or around the lamina cribosa, which is the bone through which the olfactory nerve uh, enters, the, enters the brain. And then uh, this is a summary slide looking at um, uh, persistence of the virus as a function of time. So if you look at the second line there, uh, they're looking at the time gap between diagnosis and death. And um, the virus was seen, again, it's a small study. There were only 35 or 40 people in this study, but the virus was seen um, uh, uh, up to 40 days um, after the uh, original diagnosis uh, of, of SARS. And it's seen ubiquitously. Green indicates uh, where the virus um, uh, was found at autopsy. Okay, so I have some final thoughts and I wanna leave time for questions. What do we've learned here? Well, what I've learned is that it's very clear that COVID is a multi-organ disease. The virus is not just in the nose, it's not just in the lungs, it's not just in the trachea, it's everywhere. Um, it can clearly persist for many weeks. Uh, as we get additional autopsy studies, we'll know if it can go on for months and months. I don't have that data, so I'm, I'm not here to tell you that I know. But it is very clear that there are long-term objective consequences for not only imaging studies in the brain, but functional studies, memory, cognition, et cetera. Uh, ditto for the heart, just a huge burden of cardiovascular disease has just been dumped upon us. And in the lung, uh, and I point this out in the context of people with long COVID complaining of chronic shortness of breath, the uh, autopsy study showed, and it was small, so it's, it's hard to be concrete about this, but the autopsy study showed that the severity of changes in the lung at autopsy was correlated with how long the virus persisted in the lung tissue. So the impacts of this are just going to be huge. And if you would have told me this uh, before Dave asked me to look in the literature, I would not have known any of it, and I would have said you were guessing, uh, but it seems to be very real. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And may I stop my screen sharing, Dave, at this point? Yes, you can. Okay. I'll be happy to go back to any slides if anybody uh, wants me to do that. And uh, Al has uh, said that you're, you're gonna uh, give me a copy of the slides to post on the yeah, website. Sure. Yeah. And if you want the papers, Dave, do you want me to send those in case anybody wants them? Sure. Some of those are hard to get sometimes. Yeah, we will do. So I welcome any questions, especially from this group. I don't usually like to quote sort of popular media, but I didn't have time to look anything up. But I did hear on the news this morning that they had found inflammatory markers in cerebrospinal fluid. Everybody expected that. It would be a lot more surprising if they hadn't, but it's more confirmatory information. Uh, right. Um, you're, you're certainly gonna be familiar with data that I'm not coffee, and I agree with you. It doesn't surprise me at all. Well, this doesn't count as data. This wasn't popular news, but you know, the timing is such that I thought I'd mention it. Okay. Yeah. So in Inflammatory markers, um, for the non-physicians here, inflammatory markers are uh, biomarkers, indicators of, I'm going to loosely call this uh, inflammation, white cell activity, white cells attacking something. Um, it's a term that I think is often very sloppily used, um, particularly by the integrative medicine folks. Uh, but in essence, what, what we know is that there's immune system activation. Now, what is it attacking? Why is it attacking it? There are many, many hypotheses about that, but it's hardly surprising, and I'm glad Coffee pointed it out, it's hardly surprising given the, uh, the, the brain scan abnormalities that show um, inflammatory activity of the brain and the progressive cognitive decline that occurs based on the Wuhan study that 
uh, you would see those inflammatory markers. Coffee, in what you read or heard, did they talk about when uh, in the course of the illness, the uh, cerebral spinal fluid was evaluated? This was during uh, post-COVID, the co oh, post-COVID oh, period. Okay. So not during the acute period. Okay. And um, you raised an issue a little probably too tangential for tonight, but Al and Dave, I might suggest that we could get together for a future meeting and discuss the concepts of integrative and complementary medicine, which, spoiler alert, I have shudder at, but um, no medicine coffee. is becoming really? a lot less STEM than it was when, when you and I trained. And why that's happening, what it looks like, what it means, and, and where it'll take us, I think might be a, a fruitful NMSR meeting, but it's not tonight's topic. Uh, I would I would heartily second that. It, it would be, I suspect most of your folks, Dave, don't don't know much about the integrative medicine movement and uh, and its implications. I, I think Coffee's, uh, as he often does, put his finger on a important hot button issue, well, and I too, yeah, and like I too shudder at it for what it's worth. Well, in the uh, nursing industry, this uh, therapeutic touch. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, basically um, transmitting magical energy uh, through the air is is incredibly popular among mainstream uh, nursing communities. Nursing actually prides itself on not following what they call the medical model, what Al and I would call evidence based, or the uh, I tend to call it the STEM model, um, science, scientific medicine, nursing distinguishes themselves by not making that central to their education and they take great pride in it. Wow. Um, but back to COVID, one of the things I think is worth talking about is that while clearly there's abundant evidence that there is an objective long haul syndrome or whatever else you might want to call it, post-acute syndrome, um, it's also the case that when you look at that list, you see a lot of what literally is in medical literature is called symptoms of life. Oh, I'm so fatigued. Oh, I just sometimes don't want to do my work. Oh, I get depressed sometimes. You know, oh, I don't feel as sharp as I did 20 years ago. You know, that sort of thing. People go to their doctor. They want a medical explanation for it. And every generation has a different one. I remember hypoglycemia and Epstein-Barr virus being very popular in the past. Um, and so, or Agent Orange is another one. There really isn't good statistical evidence that Agent Orange did anything to people in Vietnam, but yet there are disability payments for it and so forth. The point being that there's always going to be an overlay of stuff that isn't the thing you're looking at on top of the thing that you are actually trying to work out. Uh, I definitely believe long haul syndrome is, is real. I'm not undermining that whatsoever, but it's hard to extract the real stuff from this noise, the, the signal to noise, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So uh, Marilyn had a uh, question. Uh, when doing all this testing, is the virus still actually present? Uh, or are they testing for the presence of antibodies? And, and I had a sort of related question. So uh, when we got uh, COVID, uh, my wife and I um, end of January. And um, so I did test uh, positive with a, the PCR, the, the DNA test. And then um, um, after, you know, several days, like 10 days, I uh, tested negative with a rapid uh, antibody test. And, and uh, before we, you know, go out to a big family gathering, we, uh, we've got a bunch of those uh, free tests that were handed out. And uh, we just test the whole family, make sure we're good to go. But uh, one of our uh, COVID um, people here at New Mexico Tech said uh, that I could expect to test positive on the on the DNA test, the the PCR, for um, maybe six to ten weeks. So is that um, the jive with what you've heard? Yes. So let me answer Mar Marilyn's question first. Marilyn, I, I'm sorry if I didn't make it clear. In the autopsy study, what they were looking at is presence of virus, uh, not antibodies to the virus. Patients may have had antibodies to the virus, but it was 
uh, presumably live virus because they were looking at uh, presence of the RNA um, of the virus. They did not attempt to culture the virus, which I guess would be the gold standard test. Um, but to be clear in the autopsy study, it was persistence of virus. So okay. I, hope that, I hope that I've made that clear. And Dave, um, so the, the PCR test is extraordinarily sensitive. Uh, if there's a strand of DNA in your nose, I'm sorry, strand of RNA in your nose, uh, a strand, maybe it would be two, the PCR test would pick it up because it's, it's an amplification test. So it is literally binding uh, complementary, remember DNA is a, or RNA is a, uh, is a strand that has complementary base pairs. So if you choose the complementary base pair, say 12 base pairs long, I don't know the exact number, it's not a hundred base pairs, 12 base pairs long, specifically for the SARS virus, it will bind to any remaining SARS virus uh, RNA that's in your nose. And then an enzyme runs up and down the RNA if it has been bound uh, by the primer. And uh, you do that 24 times, uh, you can calculate as well as I can what two to the 24th is. It's a big number. And yeah. so you will find one strand of DNA. Um, so yes, that's correct. The virus that's tested for with the rapid test is a protein portion of the virus. And that falls quick no virus make more protein. So it disappears more quickly. Now, a somewhat similar question came up when people were finding uh, remnants of SARS on surfaces like boxes and tables a few days after the presumed exposure. So it's worth pointing out that if you blow up a helicopter and the pieces fall to the ground, you can find those pieces and say there was a helicopter here, but it's not the same as actually finding a flying helicopter. And the test will find fragments of the virus, whether or not there's intact viable virus present. Good point. Thank you, Pastor. I've got another question. <laughs> sure. My, my son uh, in March of 2020 had some kind of a bad bug. He could not breathe, he had shortness of breath, but he had no fever, no cough. So they wouldn't test him for uh, COVID. Also, I had a month of malaise. My other son had um, sore throat. We all recovered. My husband got nothing. And now my son has GERD and asthma, and he thinks he had COVID even though the tests have been negative. So I guess my question is, is it possible to have very similar symptoms of COVID but not quite be a perfect fit? Or was there just something else going around that we picked up at the time? Well, he wasn't tested in the March timeframe, am I correct? Uh, it was later than that. They wouldn't test him because he didn't have all the symptoms, no fever, no cough, just the difficulty breathing. And, so I, I don't how recall. Long after was he, I'm not, I'm not how long after was he tested? I'm not absolutely sure. I, I can't remember. I would say a month or so, but I can't be sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, after a month, unless you look for the antibody, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the antigen, which is Dave's test, uh, rapid test, right? Uh, or look for the RNA, which I wouldn't expect to be there, um, that uh, unless you look for the antibody, you can't say whether or not he had it. Okay, we haven't done that. Well, and you can't. Um, maybe you could talk a commercial lab into doing it. They'll, they'll resist that mightily because um, yeah. it's not been a well-standardized test. There is, there is a unique antibody to specifically SARS-CoV-2. It's, uh, I'll give you the name, but you won't find anybody who will do it. It's, it's the antibody to the nucleocapsid or nuclear protein, which is okay. specific for SARS-CoV-2. And it does persist. That it persists for a long time, many months. So it is being used in epidemiologic studies to look for previous infections mm -hmm. um, in folks, but you, I, I almost don't want to say it because I'm afraid you'll end up going down a rabbit hole trying to get somebody to test it. No, I haven't been leaning in that direction. I okay. don't, 
see any real point, but it's just something we wonder about, especially since my son keeps insisting he had COVID. And I said, well, science doesn't exactly support it, but I don't know. Did, did, uh, one other question. Did you live in Albuquerque? Yes. March, 2020? Yeah. Uh, we started to get some then, but uh, there wasn't much here. I want to tell you an anecdote though about that. Okay. Um, it's not an anecdote. It's, this is important. So in January of 2020, this was three weeks after the cases were intimated at out of Wuhan. I got a call from um, a doc that I had worked with a long time ago um, who is responsible for taking care of seven long-term care facilities in mm -hmm. Albuquerque with a total of 720 patients, I think she told me. She called me up and she, uh, she said, is, is this going to be a problem? And I said, it most certainly will be. Um, this was about a week after Tony Fauci she said the risk to Americans is low. That was precisely incorrect. <laughs> um, it wasn't incorrect, it was precisely incorrect. And so Lisa wanted to know, well, what do I do about it? So we didn't have much in testing. We did have some tests then, but they were very hard to get. And Lisa said, I'm determined to protect my patient population. This was in January of 2020. Wow. I'll heads, I'll heads yeah. up this was. Make a long story short, she uh, implemented way before anybody else in the United States, let alone New Mexico. She restricted visiting to all those facilities over, you can imagine the objections. Um, she insisted on testing people routinely, which was very costly at the time. And it wasn't just the patients she was testing. She was testing everybody who came in and out of that facility. So all the staff, um, all of the occupational therapists, physical therapists, even the janitors. Wow. Long story short, until July of 2022, well, yeah, July of 2022, no. no cases in her facilities. Oh, wow. Which shows that science works. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Now, once, once Omicron hit, <laughs> that was so communicable, all you have to do is say the word Omicron to somebody and they get infected. So. Um, she had cases after that, but no cases and no deaths in 725 people find another age and sex match population like that, that had the same results. You can't. So it's just a dramatic example of, of a physician who actually knew a little bit of epidemiology who was ahead of the curve. It works. Yeah. She's, well, there's a, hero. A, She's a hero. Yeah. There's another one out there. What's it? BA? Is that the name of it that's supposedly in New Jersey now? Uh, BA.2, right? Have you heard about yeah. that coffee, BA.2 variant? I don't know anything about it, do you? No, this is my first time hearing about it. But, I mean, there's going to be variants. It's yeah. the nature of viruses and coronavirus in particular that they're always coming up with new little variants, you know. It's like saying there's a new kind of music out. There was ska and now there's, and then there was rap, which isn't really music. And now there's whatever else, right? And it, so there will be new ones all the time. And they will tend to mutate in the direction of being more communicable, not necessarily more dangerous. It's actually the virus's benefit to be highly communicable and not too dangerous. That's but so it's not really being selected for lethality, but it is being selected for communicability. That's correct. And the more you spread people out, the less lethal the virus becomes and the more it becomes communicable. Otherwise, the virus wouldn't be there. So coffee's right. As time goes on, viruses tend to become more communicable, but not necessarily less lethal. It depends on whether or not that interferes with the life cycle, the overall life cycle of the virus. So smallpox was both lethal and communicable. Um, it didn't care. Why? because the virus itself would reside on surfaces indefinitely as long as it wasn't exposed to light or heat or water. So if a smallpox particle or virus killed somebody and it was left on their bedclothes, was there any possibility that someone else wouldn't pick up that virus? No. And so smallpox didn't have to be unlethal in order to spread because of its physical characteristics. 
coronavirus is a, um, what I want to call it, a fragile virus on surfaces. Rabies is a, another example of one that seems counterproductive. It kills its host pretty quickly. And, but it alters the brain in such a way as to make the host more effective by simply going after other, other creatures and stuff. Um, but in general, viruses tend to be, the winning strategy tends to be more contagious, less lethal is the most common pattern. It's not the only one, but it's the most common, I think. Yeah, the only exception I can think of to that general rule that I agree with is viruses that are uh, zoonotic, meaning they're in the animal population where humans are incidental hosts. So think about the viruses that uh, get headlines, Ebola. Is that a human virus? No, it's a probably a primate virus or a ground squirrel, who the hell knows. Um, uh, and whether or not it kills a human makes no difference whatsoever for the continue, continued procreation of the virus. Yeah, again, rabies is famously well tolerated in bats, and bats are great vectors because they fly around. So, you know, one of the reasons rabies gets away with killing us and dogs so quickly is because its main vector, the bats, it doesn't kill quickly. So, uh, of note is that uh, is that all of the just about all of the organisms that were. Um, were developed for use as biological weapons when, when the U.S. And, and the Russians had such a program. Uh, virtually all of them were zoonotic. They weren't human viruses because they were highly lethal. And I have to argue, though, that coronavirus's biggest advantage is human stupidity. I mean, when you have people still denying there even is a COVID problem or that vaccines are more dangerous than the COVID or something. You know, when you, when you get into those loops, when it becomes political rather than scientific, yeah, it's gonna kill a bunch of us. I mean, you know, bad things happen to stupid people and they can make bad things happen to the people around them. Well said. Uh, Tish had a uh, question. Um, she says, uh, so there's no way to say which folks are more likely to get long COVID, just uh, older people are more likely? No, uh, I didn't mean to imply that older people are more likely. Those are the ones who have been studied because in the, in the case of the VA, the data was available. Um, and uh, also older people are more likely to be in the ICU. And so if you're interested in stratifying outcome versus severity of illness, you want a lot of people who've been in the ICU. So they tend to focus on the on the older population. I did not mean in any way to say that young people don't get long COVID. No, they do. They haven't been the subject of autopsy studies because they don't tend to die. And they just haven't happened to be part of the previously uh, described UK biobank study because that was people between the ages of 40 and 60 or the VA study where the median age was I don't know, 55 or 60. So no, don't, don't take the lesson that young people don't get long COVID. We just don't have a lot of data on that. It did seem to be a clear correlation, though, between severity of disease and likelihood of sequelae. No question about that. And in terms of progressive findings cognitively or on the scanning, age was associated with more rapid progression of both of those. I know that uh, in the acute cases, Al, uh, obesity was uh, highly correlated with morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. But in your data, it wasn't correlated with long haul. That surprised me. Any thoughts about that? Nope. No thought. That's a great observation. Nope. I don't have any insights into that. Anymore. I, uh, I had a question about the provenance. Um, you know, for a while there were uh, conspiracy theories that it was a, a lab leak. Um, and I, I think those are, you know, pretty well uh, debunked. Uh, but the, the, the latest uh, theory that does have some credibility is, is it did probably come from Wuhan, uh, but not a lab, but uh, one of the animal markets. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I saw the paper. I haven't read it. 
Uh, it's in Nature Medicine, I believe. Um, the conclusion is that it's far more likely to have occurred just as a result of uh, uh, an untoward event in, uh, in an animal. And I hate this phrase. It just so happened the virus jumped to a human. I just hate that phrase. <laughs> um, but uh, almost certainly wasn't, uh, wasn't from either of the two uh, virology labs that are in Wuhan. It would be nice to be able to look at the inventory of, of viruses that are, that are in the high containment lab at Wuhan, uh, but the, the Chinese are not just, are, are decided not to be forthcoming with that. And I'm sure they have their reasons. Well, it's a good example of some of the harm that can be done when, when governments try to massage the news to make themselves look better. You know, China is famous for that, but the U.S. and Russia do a lot of that as well. Maybe most countries do. Because China you know, tried to sort of smooth it over for a while and did not want their labs evaluated, both because of proprietary things that the evaluators might find and because they didn't want to be, who, who likes someone looking over their shoulder when you're doing delicate work, right? I mean, it's creepy to have people from other countries come and say, how well are you running your lab? I can see why it makes them uncomfortable. But the net effect of that was on this side of the ocean, we were left with people saying, well, we can't rule out that it came from the lab. And in the mind of the QAnon people and a lot of other folks, that was tantamount to saying, we've proven that the Chinese created this as a weapon in their labs, you know, which is a very wildly different statement. Okay. Well, that was uh, certainly a fascinating discussion. An anybody have any more uh, comments? Well, Dave, I'll get the uh, slides to you along with the papers and you can feel free to distribute them to whomever you can. Okay. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't uh, put the papers on the web though because they're... Um, just because of copyright concerns and all that. Okay. Yeah. I'll just uh, email them to people I want. Yeah, I would uh, definitely would not put them up on the web, but I think okay. it's fair to. But, to but your uh, your slides I can put on the web. Oh yeah, sure. Excellent. Okay. Looks looks like we got a couple more things in the. Yeah, coffee. Uh, uh, wants a copy. So uh, of the papers, coffee. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. Well, uh, the slides actually. Oh, okay. Because they'll have the references. I can I can get to the papers. But right. uh, Al, that was a beautiful presentation, by the way. Really, really nicely done. Yeah. Thank you. Really it's, uh, certainly enjoy I want to thank Dave for uh, asking me to do it. Um, I don't know that I would have had the energy to do it independently. So thank you, Dave. All right. Well, we sure appreciate your filling up and uh, digging into it so thoroughly. It's kind of, kind of alarming, though. But uh, better to know than not. I think so. All righty. Well, uh, take care. And um, we'll see everybody back in uh, uh, April. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Take care.